If you're looking to buy a camera right now for videography, make no mistake because there are lots of great options out there and it's not always clear what offers the best bang for the buck. So in this video we will cut through the noise and focus on the best cameras in each price category, highlighting some unexpected gems. A few things to note before we get started. At first, if a camera isn't mentioned here, that means that the cameras that are mentioned offer superior value. That doesn't mean that your camera is bad or so, it just means that the market changes all the time. Second, I will leave all the links to the cameras that are mentioned in this video in the description below. Those are affiliate links, so I get a small commission if you purchase to those links, but you don't pay anything extra and Amazon generally offers good deals, so check them out there. It's a great way to support this channel. Third, it's December 2023 right now. All cameras that are out there are pretty good actually, but there might be some changes of course in the next few months or so. So in that case, I will leave comments below where I give you up-to-date information and there will also be a link in the description description below to a blog article that I always keep up to date with the current cameras so you always know what to purchase by looking at either the comments or the blog article. Fourth point is that I mentioned categories here like mid-range, semi-professional, etc. Those are just names to describe the pricing. They don't have anything to do with the actual capabilities of those cameras. There are for example semi-professional cameras that you can totally use on a professional shoot and also professional level cameras that are kind of, uh, I would probably use a mid-range camera or so. And the last point is that I will also not mention cinema cameras here because if you're a professional, if you're a cinematographer or so, you already know what you need and I don't think you really have to watch this video here for that. I think in that case there are better channels to watch. Okay, let's start with the entry-level market. Cameras below $1,000. The cameras that I want to mention here is at first the Sony ZV-10, Nikon Z30, the Fujifilm XS10 and Canon R10. Now, most people would probably look into the Sony ZV-10 here because it's pretty hyped a lot, but it's actually good in terms of having many lens choices that you can also use with higher-end Sony bodies later so you don't have to buy new lenses all the time. The autofocus of the ZV-10 is also really good. I would actually say it's the best in that price range but there are also some major downsides of the ZV-E10 that is at first that you have really bad rolling shutter so if you move the camera a little bit too fast all the lines bend and it just looks ugly. I actually used this camera for a few weeks and sold it directly again because to me the footage looked really bad because of this effect and another problem with the ZV-E10 is that it crops quite a bit if you turn electronic image stabilization on what means that if you want to vlog for example that you wait to close to your face. So if you're lo looking for a great vlogging camera, I would probably not recommend that. That's why I actually think that all of the other cameras in that price category offer you more bang for the buck. So at first the Nikon Z30 for example, it's overall a very similar camera to the ZV-E10. Autofocus is a little bit weaker but still good enough to track your face from what I've seen and Nikon has figured out a way to put electronic image stabilization into this camera without cropping at all. So if you want to vlog for example you can be sure that the angle is still wide enough to cover your face and it doesn't look bad you're not too close to the camera then. And then there is the Fujifilm X-S10 which actually has a stabilized sensor and that's the only camera in that price range that offers that so it doesn't have to crop as well and there Therefore, it's great for vlogging, etc., and gives you really nice, smooth footage. And Fujifilm also offers film simulations in all of their cameras, what means that you, even if you don't color grade your footage, you get this nice film look. And I think that actually makes this camera really appealing to many people. And then when we're looking at the Canon R10, this is a camera that already offers you some features that are a bit more pro level. There is at first 4K60, it comes with a crop, but still looks good enough. And it also gives you HDR PQ recording in 10 bit in 4K, what means that this camera is already a bit better for color grading if you want to get into that. However, the R10 also crops if you turn electronic image stabilization on, but I must say that the lens stabilization of Canon lenses is generally pretty good, so you probably don't even have to turn that on at all. And then it's also great for vlogging. So if you're looking into the Sony ZV-E10 right now, you should think twice because I at least think that all those other cameras offer you a better bang for the buck overall. Reasons to get the E10 might be as a B camera for your other Sony cameras for example or if you plan on buying a higher end Sony camera in the future and you want to be able to use the lenses with those cameras as well. But to be honest I would personally not buy any of those cameras in this price category because there's also your phone. This is the iPhone 15 Pro. I made a few videos about that in the past. The footage coming out of the iPhone 15 Pro if you should 
shoot an Apple log actually looks very similar to the footage that I get from pro cameras. That's why I would actually keep using my phone at first and I would save a bit more money until I would be able to afford a camera in the mid-range price category because as we will find out soon, the cameras in the mid-range price category are already a huge step up from the entry-level category. So if you can wait a few months or so with buying a camera, maybe use your phone first and then switch to something good directly instead of wasting your money in that entry-level category. And of course, it mustn't be an iPhone 15 Pro, even the 13 Pro, 14 Pro, etc. already shoot pretty good footage. It's just not as nice as the 15 Pro in Apple Lock. Let's come to the mid-range category, which are cameras in between $1,000 and $2,000. And as mentioned before, this is already a huge step up. With all the newer modern cameras that are in this price range, there's actually no camera that I can't recommend at all because they're all good. And the reason for that is that each of those cameras offers at least 4K in 60 frames per second in 10-bit 4 to 2, which essentially means that at first you can get slow motion of up to 40% if you shoot in 60 frames per second. That's great and all of that in 4K. In Full HD, for example, you can also shoot even more slow motion, but honestly, I only shoot 4K, so that's the only number that really counts for me. And 10 with 4 to 2 means that the footage from these cameras is better for color grading. You also get more dynamic range there, what means that you have more details in the shadows and the highlights at the same time. And that is important to make your footage look pro. In fact, I would actually say that the footage of those cameras in most situations is hard to impossible to distinguish from pro-level cameras. So let's start with the cameras itself. It's at first here the Fujifilm X-S20. Then we have the Canon R8 in the line here, which is actually a full-frame camera. Sony offers the FX30 and A6700, which is essentially the same camera under the hood, but the bodies are a bit different. And we also have Panasonic here with the S5 Mark II, which seems to be a really nice video camera as well. So let's get into it. As mentioned before, they all shoot 4K 60 frames per second in 10 bit 42, but there is where Sony shines a little bit more. Both the FX30 and the A6700 offer 4K and up to 120 frames per second in 10 bit 42. Now, 120 frames per second has a strong crop, but it's still better to have that than not and oftentimes when you shoot slow motion footage you want to be a bit closer to the subjects as well so actually the crop shouldn't be much of an issue and also talking about the Sony cameras right now Sony is the king of autofocus right now so the autofocus on those cameras is in my opinion the best and they also have another great video feature which is that they have LUT import so you can import the LUTs that you would use to color grade your footage on your computer put them into your camera and you directly see on the display how it will look later and you you can even bake those LUTs in so if you find that it already looks good enough on your display you don't even have to color grade anymore on your computer because you directly get the look from the LUT. The A6700 also includes AI features what essentially means that it can crop for example into the image and then track your face as if, as if someone would follow you with a camera that can be pretty cool in certain situations and both Sony cameras here also offer breathing compensation so if your lens slightly zooms in and out while it focuses can compensate for that so it looks a bit smoother. However, the Fujifilm X-S20 also offers some unique features. It can shoot in a format that's called open gate, what means that it records the full sensor, which is three by two aspect ratio, and then you can decide in post how you will crop it. This footage is also in 6K, so you get a lot of pixels to work with there. That's, for example, good if you wanna do vertical video and landscape or widescreen format videos from the same file. And and again, Fujifilm has film simulations, so if you don't want to color grade your footage but you want to get that film look, then that's the camera to go for. It's actually the camera here, and what I also love about the XS20 is that it's just so light. I think the body is 420 grams or so, and pair that with the Sigma 18 to 50 here, for example, and you get a super compact setup that is just perfect for travel. It's also very affordable at $1,300. I went on a trip to Hong Kong, for example, recently, and I only brought this setup plus one Viltrox lens because I only wanted to travel with carry-on luggage there. The footage looks great as you can see here and 
I didn't have to carry much around, just this super small body and lens here. So if you want to go small and you also want to save some money, it's definitely the camera to get. We also have two full frame cameras in that category here. At first the Canon R8 and the Panasonic S5 Mark II. Canon R8 is a difficult camera I find it's overall nice because it gives you oversampled 4k 60 from a full frame sensor so you have really nice detailed footage there etc you also get Canon colors and it doesn't have elect or sensor stabilization it only has electronic image stabilization which can be an advantage or disadvantage depending on how you see it at first of course if you have a stabilized sensor and you're a bit more cropped in if you shoot a tele lens for example that means that your footage would be more stable so on the Canon R8 you will get a bit more shake then but on the opposite side if you shoot on ultra wide angle lenses for vlogging for example then with sensor stabilization on Canon cameras you would usually get wobble in the corners what many people don't like but because the Canon R8 does not have sensor stabilization you don't get that it's really it can be an advantage or disadvantage that depends on you but overall I must say that while I really loved the Canon R8 when I had it because the body is really nice it grips well it's small etc I, I find it hard to recommend this camera to many people because you at first have to pay a lot of money for the lenses because the cheaper lenses from Canon they are not that great they have pretty high apertures etc so I wouldn't really get one of those that's why I would say that you should only get the R8 really as a B camera to your Canon R5 or R6 Mark II or so but I think if you want to get into videography here in that price range and you want to save a bit of money then it's not the right system simply because the lenses are so expensive now I understand people say it's a full frame camera so it must be better than all the APS-C cameras there but if you look at the footage it's actually not a dynamic range for example is better on the APS-C cameras here than on the Canon which is because they use backside illuminated sensor so it's not just about the sensor size actually it's also about the technology that they use and the technology that Fuji and Sony use for example on their APS-C cameras is better and actually the camera that I'm shooting on right now is the Fujifilm X-H2S which is also an APS-C camera just a bit more expensive as you can see it looks great right so better think twice in that price range don't get distracted by the term full frame it doesn't mean that much but talking about full frame cameras let's come to the Panasonic S5 Mark II which seemed to be a terrific video camera couldn't use it myself yet but from what I've seen it's great and what makes this camera so special is also that it has an internal fan so you will most likely never get any overheating with this camera and it's also full frame offers 4k 60 recording with a crop but still pretty good and it also has some great video centric features such as waveform monitoring so that you can expose your shots a bit easier and it also offers internal LUT support what I find what makes this camera special is that it all that it offers all of that in a hybrid body like you can perfectly use it for photography but you can also use it for video so if you're more that hybrid shooter then it's definitely also something to look into especially if you want to have full frame for example to use it with wide angle f 2.8 zoom lenses because that is where full frame cameras are actually a bit unique compared to APS-C cameras because those ultra wide angle zoom lenses at a lower aperture give you lots of background blur I actually missing there because there you would actually have to go lower than f 2.8 8 to get the same look. So Panasonic S5 Mark II definitely a camera that you should look into. If I would have to pick one, it's actually what I have here, the XS20, but that's only because I travel a lot and I like to have a super lightweight camera and camera setup with me there, so the lenses are also a reason why I would go for the XS20. However, I think for most content creators, the Sony FX30 or A6700 cameras offer the best bang for the buck in that price range, so you probably want to look into those cameras. Next up is the semi-professional category between $2,000 and $3,000 and at first I want to say here that if you skip the video until here probably also watch the mid-range category because there are some cameras in there that might already offer everything you need at a much smaller price point. The Panasonic S5 Mark II for example is a very similar camera as the Sony a7 IV but it comes at a much lower price point and offers some additional features so you might want to look into that as well if you're interested in the a7 IV. The cameras that I want to talk about here is again the Sony a7 IV, Sony ZV-E1, the Fujifilm X-H2S and the Canon R6 Mark II 
And when it comes to the XH2S, R6 Mark II and A7 IV, I already made a video about that like a year ago or so where I compare those three cameras. So I will link, leave a link to that in the description as well. There you can find a more detailed comparison. However, let's get started. Overall, those cameras offer many features that are the same, like 4K60 up to 10 bit, etc. However, there are some major differences. So at first, when we're looking at the Sony A7 IV, for example, it's overall a camera that has great dynamic range. It has the best autofocusing system, in my opinion, of all of those cameras. Well, the difference is not, not a lot, like all of those cameras perform really good when it comes to autofocusing. But then there are also some downsides. It has 33 megapixel, what for video is actually not that great because it gives you more rolling shutters. So line spent a bit more. However, in most situations on this camera, it's still good enough. And it also has a 1.5x crop in 4K, 60 frames per second. So you're a bit closer to your subject. Also not a big issue, but sometimes that can be a bit annoying. And that's a big difference, for example, on the Canon R6 Mark II. That one can record 4K 60 frames per second oversampled without a crop, which is great. So if you shoot that a lot, you might want to look in this into this camera. However, the dynamic range of the R6 Mark II is quite a bit lower as on the a7 IV. And when it comes to low light, I would also rate it below the a7 IV and actually all other, other cameras in this price category. Category. And then there is one camera which is quite special, the Sony ZV-E1. It's a very small body, but the sensor inside is the same as on the A7S III and FX3. So you only get 12 megapixels, what is actually great for video because the camera has to read less information, so it reads faster. That at first means that you get really good rolling shutter performance there, so even if you move the camera fast, the image still looks really good and not that distorted. You also have really good low light performance, actually the best in this category. The dynamic range is also really good plus it offers 4k 120 frames per second and even some AI features so that's why if you're looking for a video focused camera in that price range you would probably look mostly into the ZV-E1 it's a great price small body and it offers all these insane features however when it comes to the body while it's great that it's small it also lags a bit behind other camera bodies because you have less buttons and therefore less customization options that means that while you're shooting with this camera you will be slower except for if you set the camera to automatic for example what many vloggers might do that's why when I tried this camera I was actually not a big fan of that I think in that price range I want to have a body that is a bit more pro that gives me all the buttons etc but if you don't need that that's probably the best camera in that price range to go for however there's also the Fujifilm X-H2S what I'm shooting on right now I would say this is overall the winner here because this is the best hybrid camera that you can get not just in this price range but also beyond probably until like four thousand dollars or something like that and the reason for that is that the Fujifilm X-H2S offers a stacked sensor what offers really fast readouts so at first if you also want to do a bit of photography you get 26 megapixels and Fujifilm film simulations so you always get really nice looking JPEGs etc but then when we're talking about video this thing is completely insane. At first you have 4K in 10 bit 42 up to 120 frames per second. The rolling shutter performance is about as good as actually slightly better in certain modes as it is on a Sony ZV-E1 or A7S III etc. Then you have really good dynamic range that is also about on the same level as the ZV-E10 and the other cameras that I already mentioned. Plus you have open gate recording in 6.2K 3 by 2 aspect ratio so again that's great if you also do vertical video etc because you can use the same video file for multiple formats and it also offers internal ProRes recording and even external ProRes RAW etc. So if you're looking at all the specs of all the video specs of this camera are insane plus it's also really good for photography actually and that's also why I would overall say that the Fujifilm X-H2S is the winner in that price category and actually beyond like it even outperforms some cameras that cost even more however it's an APS-C camera it's not a full frame camera so maybe if you need that full frame wide angle zoom lens f2.8 look for example and you might want to look into those other cameras also maybe you use other Sony cameras or so then you also maybe want to get the ZV-E1 to complement it with 120p shooting or you want to get the a7 IV for other reasons for photography also or so on so there are good reasons to get into those other cameras as well but if you're overall looking at what a camera offers you for the price then the Fujifilm X-H2S is clearly the winner in this price range.
So let's come to the pro level category here. Basically all cameras that are beyond $3,000, which is a lot. There are a lot of cameras in this category. And I would say let's first start with the bit cheaper cameras. And that's mainly the a7S III and FX3. Still kind of the Nikon Z8, which seemed to be really nice. And of course, Canon R5 and R5C. So of all of those cameras, I think if you're looking for a great hybrid camera that does both well, then and the R5 and R5C is great. I, I used the R5 a few months ago for quite some time and I actually liked it when I shot photos with it. There was so much detail in it. The 45 megapixels are great. Then on the video side, you have 8K available. It shoots 4K up to 120p. Yes, not oversampled, but it still looks very good. It's perfectly usable. The dynamic range of this camera is a bit lower and the rolling shutter is also not the best. So I would probably not use it much if you want to film a lot of action shots etc therefore it's not the right camera however as mentioned before as a hybrid camera it's a good one especially if you're looking for something cheaper than the Nikon Z8 because when it actually comes to the best hybrid camera in that price range that's probably the one that you would look into that also has 8k and 45 megapixels and it has a stacked sensor it doesn't even need a shutter because it reads so fast and it even offers 8k up to 60 frames per second in my opinion at least the body is just still a bit too heavy that's why i would personally not consider this camera i looked into it because of all those great features but with such a heavy body, I just don't see myself using it. However, if you want all this 8K, 45 megapixel, etc., and you have that money for the Z8, then definitely look into that. But if you're not looking into hybrid cameras, if you only want something for video, then clearly the Sony A7S III or FX3, those are the best options there. Lower megapixels are great for that, so you probably won't use it much for photography, same as the ZV-E1. But Sony also announced a new camera, which is the A9 Mark three again i would count it as a great hybrid camera it's made mainly for sports photography but the video features are also great 4k 60 recording oversampled from the full sensor width 4k 120 frames per second not oversampled but still good looking and it offers 24 megapixels so again if you also want to use it as a hybrid camera for photography that's a really good option and what makes this camera special is the global shutter so no matter how fast you move it you will never get rolling shutter effect it will never be distorted or anything and of course there's also the King Sony A1 8k 50 megapixels etc I would personally never shoot it because it doesn't have a flip screen might not be an issue for you but yeah if you're looking for a camera that has all these great video options and 8k then that's certainly something that you want to look into as well. What about me? What would I choose? I mean, I'm shooting mostly travel content and I prefer hybrid bodies because I want to have one body that shoots both great photo and video at the same time. So this is why I would look into the A9 Mark III and if enough money comes in over the next year, then I would probably even do that because I think it will be a great camera. Just curious about the dynamic range because there's still no review available that actually tests that artificially like um, CineD, etc. do that. So I have to wait for that. However, if I would only look for a video centric body to complement other cameras, then I would look into the A7S III here. Actually used that before for one and a half years or so. And I would prefer that over the FX3 because it has a viewfinder. I'm one of those guys that want to have viewfinders all the time i can't live without it even for video work and yeah for commercial work where i don't really worry about the body weight etc because it's stationary maybe planned shots or so then i would certainly look into the nikon z8 so you see it's, it's like hard to say what i would actually choose because it really depends on the shooting scenario but for me overall i think the sony a9 mark iii would likely make it otherwise the a7s III, also because of the price Okay, that was a long one. Let's wrap this video up here. I can only say that the camera market right now is awesome because if you're looking at at least everything that's $1,300 and beyond and came out of the past one or two, maybe three years, it's actually great. Like all of those cameras offer everything that you really need as a videographer. 4K up to 60 frames per second minimum in 10 bit 42. You don't really need more. The dynamic range of all of those cameras is pretty good. Yes, it's a bit different 
different. Some have 12, others have 13, others have more like 14 stops already, but it's always in the range that the footage looks good. And that's why I would actually say that if you use any of those cameras, at least in the mid-range, semi-professional or professional category here, I can only say that if your footage doesn't come out good, that's never the camera's fault, that's always on you. However, I think when it comes to the entry-level market, there is still some room. I hope that some better cameras come out there soon with maybe 10 bit at least in 4K30 or something like that. But well, it's also entry level, it's pretty low price, so we can't expect too much there. And as mentioned before, if you're in that price range, then definitely consider using your iPhone first because the footage of that is good enough and it's actually quite insane what you can do with that. So that's my wrap up here. I hope it was helpful. If yes, then please leave me a thumbs up and also consider subscribing for upcoming video tutorials and reviews. And again, also have a quick look in the comments below and in the description for updates in case new cameras come out or so. Obviously, I can't make a new video like that every time a, a new camera comes out, but it's quite easy to leave a comment below or to update my blog post. So that's it. I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.